Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. I am Lalita Duperon. I am the Associate Director in the Centre for South Asia, uh, and I thank you all for being here. Before we start, I just want to um, hold space for everyone uh, whose loved ones are being affected by the crisis in India. I want to make sure that we acknowledge that. Uh, I'd also like to direct you to a um, webinar that we held last night with Dr. Mahadevan, who just returned from India, it was a Q&A format uh, around some of the medical issues around COVID, and that is on our YouTube channel. And I think it is, yes, it's hitting the chat right now. So you can uh, click on that. And um, along with that, we also created a, a kind of repository of organizations that are working on the ground in India right now. And there'll be a link in the chat to that as well. Uh, we haven't vetted or endorsed these organizations. It's just a holding place uh, where people have sent us links. So you can check that out if you are interested in that. I also want to acknowledge that Stanford sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Mowekma Olone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Olone people. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to honor and make visible the university's relationship to indigenous peoples. Today's format will be uh, Sweta Balakrishnan talking about their book. Uh, and then I will start off with a few questions and then we're going to open it up for audience Q&A. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and um, I will moderate them. I'll probably weave some questions together and uh, heads up that we usually do not get to all the questions, but we'll do what we can. Uh, and we do send all the questions to the speaker afterwards. So even if we can't address them live, uh, uh, we will uh, make sure that the speaker sees them. Today's speaker, I'm just delighted to welcome them, Sweta Balakrishnan, Assistant Professor of Law and Assistant Professor by courtesy, Assistant Professor of Sociology, Asian American Studies and Criminology, Law and Society at the University of California, Irvine. They are the co-director of the Center for Empirical Research on the Legal Profession and co-convener of the Social Legal Studies Workshop. They're a social legal scholar whose research examines the intersections between law, globalization and stratification from a critical feminist perspective. Particularly across a range of sites and different levels of analysis, their work interrogates how law and legal institutions create continue and counter different kinds of socioeconomic inequalities. Scholarship from these projects has appeared in a wide range of legal journals. Uh, and I'm also gonna mention three books. Uh, their first book, which is the topic of today's event, Accidental Feminism, unpacks the case of unintentional gender parity among India's elite legal professionals. And we're about to hear much more about that. A second book, Invisible Institutions, with Sarah Desilet, brings together cross-subjective perspectives on legal globalization. And a third, forthcoming book with Kalapana Kanabiran, Gender Regimes and the Politics of Privacy, investigates the gendered legacies of India's privacy jurisprudence. So uh, incredibly prolific person. We are so happy that you were able to make time for us today. Please join me in welcoming Sweta Balakrishnan. Now, it is so great to be back. I, um, so much of this was written at Stanford. I, it's such a hard time for everybody. So I wanna join Lolita in acknowledging how hard this moment is. And I see 26 participants, which means so many of you have made time during a period that no one should be doing any Zoom, anything. So I appreciate you, I appreciate your time. Um, I'm gonna share my screen so we can sort of get to the book, but I do wanna, I wanna acknowledge that, you know, the webinar doesn't allow me to, to, to see you or hear you nod or have you put your hands up. So, you know, I'm gonna try and keep my comments as short as possible. Um, actually, Ulita Simra, can one of you tell me if you see the screen? Cause I know this can be clinky sometimes. Yeah, we still have, we have that top bar, so just move your mouse. But beyond that, everything is. I wonder if that just goes away in a second. Okay, okay. doesn't matter anyway. Okay, now you guys know I use Chrome. 
Um, it's, you know, I'm so glad to be here and I can't believe, you know, I, I can't believe that after all this time I get to come back and um, speak to the very community that helped me start the project that would end up becoming this book um, long before my work was work or <laughs> my work was prolific. Um, it was funded by the Center for South Asia. I got two summer grants to help do this work when I was a grad student at Stanford. And so many of you in ways, you know, political economy as I'll make the argument over the course of the book really matters, but in ways that were way beyond just funding me, um, you all helped with conversations and, um, you know, cartados and talks in the quad, like you all helped make this book. So I wish I could see you and say, thank you so much for this, but know that I'm actually sending out that energy because I'm so grateful for this community and the way in which it helped me make this book. Um, in the interest of keeping this as sort of uh, informative as possible, because I'm going to assume that a lot of you have not read the book yet, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to I'm going to keep this about 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to set up the main argument of the book and then think through one chapter, which I think has legs for the ways in which the rest of the book sits on. Um, some of the best advice I got actually writing this book was that, you know, the book is always thought of as this end of a long journey, but it's also the start of a conversation. So I really look forward to your thoughts and comments and, and hope that we can start this as a place to like think through together more things that might, um, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in the ways in which this sits or doesn't sit with you and sort of what that process allows for us to think together. Um, as Alita mentioned, I'm broadly interested in the synergy between globalization and equality and organizations or institutions that we take for granted. It's a very law and society lens, but um, it's also like a critical post-colonial lens, although it, it sort of is from this tradition of law and society. I'm uh, particularly interested in the sort of multiplicities of things like South, right? Like when they say global South, what do you actually mean? Uh, I'm much more interested in moving past categories to think about what kinds of theoretical continuums we can think about as we talk about a lot of, um, a lot of spaces and sites and methods. Um, three main foci sort of ground my work. I'm really interested in global institutions broadly from a comparative perspective. Um, I'm interested in legal education and sort of organizational diversity, sort of that's where the substance of it usually comes out. But this project, as you read, is sort of like a packing of all of that together to think about the individual actor, right? Like how does mobility actually happen? What does it have to do? What does that experience have to do for the way in which we can think about larger conceptions of social movements or the lack of them? Um, and more and more, what binds all of my projects is this idea of the peripheral actor, right? I'm really interested in the periphery. So uh, even if something doesn't look like a peripheral thing, even if it's a more, you know, even if it's a minority for a range of reasons, how do these kinds of peripheries come to exist? What kind of nuance is there to start from that as a unit of analysis rather than to add them later, right? A lot of intersectional analysis adds the peripheral actor, however that peripheral actor is thought of, um, as an end to a situation rather than as the start. But I'm much more interested in that subversive logic of how, if you start from the peripheral actor, what can that say about the larger institutions we're trying to dissect? Um, I want to start by sort of making a claim that this project, even, I mean, it's, it's called Accidental Feminism, but the start of it was also accidental. I didn't go in, uh, this wasn't a feminist project. I mean, it was a feminist project to the extent that I guess I have over different periods of time associated or not associated with that term, but it wasn't a gender project. I wasn't looking for a gender finding when I started this project. I was broadly interested in, in kinds of legal organizations in India and the sort of lived experiences of people in different kinds of organizations, but I was really interested in like the global diffusion of norms, right? So what happens when following regula uh, regulatory change or law what kinds of lived experiences change or don't change? Like that was sort of like my main source of analysis. I think I started with a class mobility logic. That's what, what I thought I would find. And I was really interested when this global diffusion of the legal profession project, I mean, at the time this was uh, when I was still a law student in the US and I was um, studying legal process outsourcing firms. So this is about 15 years ago. And I was interested in thinking about how the uh, network flows of legal process outsourcing was doing globalization in a particular sort of way. And that was where this project started. And I thought, oh, there's also large law firms, which is sort of complicating our understandings of regulation, complicating our understandings of uh, what it even means to do corporate work, but also who does this work. And so how does that critically complicate labor? That was the sort of start of this project. 
Um, but it wasn't started as the idea of, I mean, the idea that started it was not feminism. And I want to make that clear because I think it has theoretical resonance for why it ended up being a book that I called accidental feminism. And I hope we get to that question or think through that a little bit more together at the end of the talk. Um, the empirical puzzle that actually launched me into this version of the book, right? Like any book can be one of 12 or 15 books. It happened to become this book, I think, was because early in the early in my field work during a pilot, uh, uh, during the pilot wave of my data collection, there was a female lawyer in an elite law firm in, in Mumbai in, in sort of 2011 who said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand. You know, you, you come from, you, at that point, I was a fellow at, a, at, a, at, at Harvard at the law school. And her claim was that I get what you're talking about, but the way in which gender is diverse in the US doesn't really port to the way gender is diverse in India. Um, and she gave me this example of how when she was on a sabbatical or like a secondment in this in this other firm in the US, um, many people would walk up to her and ask her about, you know, you, you know, everyone had a story about how people would be asked whether they were a paralegal or a secretary. But she, in comparison, was thinking through how her experience had never primed that, right? So she had to confess as, you know, as I put in the um, in the slide here, she's like, as someone who has the only non-white woman from a developing country, I never felt the same pressures while working in India. Now, of course, like if you're a pessimistic sociologist that's trained to sort of hear privilege speak about, uh, be spoken in this way, it's very easy to just quote this as a class advantage or a caste advantage, right? Um, and of course, those advantages definitely exist. And it was easy to think of this as just a one, it was easy to think of this as just like a single narrative that wasn't actually representative of a larger sample. And the reason that was sort of also the case is because around the same time, a colleague of mine was doing a demography of the legal profession across different sites. And I don't know if you can see the lines properly, but the only thing that's relevant for this is that right at the bottom is um, sort of where India and China are, right? So this is like, in general, there's a trend, there's an upward trend for how, um, there's an upward trend for how um, feminization of the legal profession happens. And the least feminized of all legal professions are India and China, right? So no matter what data you use, um, India has very few women in the larger legal profession. And so it complicated the analysis a little bit because it brought up a sort of unique difference in how representation of women were happening in elite spaces, right? That's unusual because usually when you find a feminization of a workforce, it happens in low status work or it happens in very feminized work. So if you think of comparative accounts or existing logics in the literature, there's one of sort of two big arguments, right? Like one is it's a purely functional argument, right? So secretaries or uh, nurses or, or, or um, administrative professionals, very specifically, uh, you know, culturally gender typed work is the work where women start to get slotted in um, or the occupational field if will start to get desegregated or devalued in some way, in a way that will start to over time make it sort of uh, less prestigious, right? So, or, or less paying, definitely, if you think about the political economy of it. So OBGYNs, like, you know, the, after the Second World War, there was a large increase in the number of women who entered the medical workforce, but it didn't result in, you know, women, uh, women doctors being paid the same amount. It started to then occupationally subsegregate in a way where women would start filling in um, would start filling in, especially once the men came back after the war and could re-enter the professional logic, they would fill in, um, they would fill in subfields, which then were still functionally a certain way, right? And, and sort of it's very rare for an elite professional workforce to become uh, feminized while it's still very prestigious overall. And so both these cases, right, it was, um, it, it was interesting for me because it was not one of the natural accounts of how gender gets done in professional work, but it also wasn't a way in which gender gets done within global south accounts, broadly speaking. And remember the caveat I started this with, right? I don't think of global south as, um, I, I don't think of global south as a unitary concept. I think of it as a very fluid concept, but still there's, you know, it, it, over and above everything else, it was very rare for there to be this kind of parity to work in this way. Um, and so there was a pivot at that stage. So in, in 2011, 12, when I came back from field work, I wrote a paper called uh, Why is Gender a Form of Diversity from my, from my pilot data? And then decided that this was the pivot I was gonna take. I was gonna start 
making my um, making the project much more about um, much more about gender and thinking through what kinds of explanations could actually um, produce this kind of outcome. So I was interested from like a gender, you know, gender structure perspective, which was central to my training as a sociologist. Uh, I was interested in individual level variables, right? So does it matter what schools they go to? Does it matter what families they come from, which cities they're from? Um, at the interactional level, I was really interested in sort of what are their experiences with their peers? How, what are their experiences with their clients? Um, and sort of most institutionally, I was like, how is this lived experience then changing the ways in which they get thought about or they get they get um, fit into different kinds of um, in, in narratives within the firm, but also for people who are looking from the outside into the firm. I mentioned all of this because this didn't happen overnight, right? It's a 10 year process of going backwards and forwards and thinking through whether I wanted to write the book in this particular way. But this then became the sort of design that then predicated what the book would be and what the data would be. Again, I'm happy to take questions about data, but broadly it's uh, 139 um, interviews between 2011 and 15. They were mostly in Mumbai, India. Um, there were observations, a lot a parts of an observation, and then a lot of content analysis of public sources when they spoke about uh, liberalization and lawyers. Um, the main focus was sort of successful women in what I call elite global firms, and they're not actually global firms, as I will make the case in a second. They were really elite, um, they were really elite law firms. So they were they were high-end um, law firms which had more than 250 lawyers, but also had the largest market share of, um, of all the clients that did work in India. Um, and so the senior women were the main sample. So I oversampled women. They, there were men, of course, in these firms. And then I added competitive sites that I'll talk to you about in a second. And I had a large attrition sample, which was people who went through this firm, but then couldn't. Because you know, often what happens in data like this is that you think through the experience of the, of the successful candidate, and it makes a case for why someone is successful. But if you don't actually track the people who are not successful, you don't have a sense of what it is about that success that's necessary for just that specific person. Um, the data as the data sort of um, very quickly, right? Like was this, I, like I said, I started to change the kinds of spaces where I thought it would be interesting to track this. So it started off with, is this a question of like, it was an analytical design sample. So I started off with thinking something cool is happening in traditional transactional law firms. That's interesting. And, you know, I sort of had an intuition that this was not the case in traditional legal practice or so like litigating firms that, you know, older litigating firms, it was not the case. And, and of course, so I added a, I added a sort of think of it as a base sample of like traditional litigation practice, which could then show what a difference it was that these women in these elite law firms were having. So that was the first stage of it. I added this traditional legal practice. When I came back and um, showed my findings and I said, you know, something's happening in these law firms that's distinctly different. And I workshopped it actually at the center um, many years ago. And I had someone in one of these workshops say to me, that's really interesting. So you think it's a function of novelty? And I think, and I said, yes, uh, at the time, Cecilia Ridgway had written a book called Frame by Gender. And um, the argument there was that, you know, there are certain background frameworks of how gender operates and that, and that that gets attached to work even before work can actually be unpacked and undone in different ways. And so um, Ridgway's argument was very stark in my mind because you know, she was a professor at Stanford when I was there. She was, I was thinking through this with her in her class. And I thought to myself, I was like, yeah, something about this is novelty because part of her argument is that novelty helps us think about new capacities of framing, right? So when something is brand new, pre-existing frameworks of how gender ought to attach don't attach seamlessly. They attach a little bit, they, there's a lag between what you think a person has to do versus what it is the person actually does, which allows you um, to reset the norms for an institution, right? So this was, this was work that tracked along with colleagues, ways in which startups in Silicon Valley, for example, are because they're brand new, you'd imagine them all to have better gender outcomes, but they're not because the feeding institutions were all engineering schools. But you contrast that with biotech startups where the field that's filling into it is actually not gender typed, then the, then, the, then the startup, which is a new frame, allows for there to be a renegotiation of hierarchy. So there are more women in biotech startups than in, um, than in um, sort of traditional male startups because of the, because of the pipeline. But new, new kinds of spaces can allow for new kinds of possibility. I mentioned this because that was sort of what I thought was gonna be my big argument. I was gonna, I was gonna suggest that yes, that novelty is changing the ways in which um, 
the, the identity of the ideal worker, which is Acker's perspective, can get moderated. And because it gets changed, there is a capacity for these new fancy women lawyers in uh, large law firms to renegotiate what it means to be a lawyer. That line of argument, I think people bought that line of argument, but then I had this really persuasive comment in one of the workshops that said, that's really interesting, but it was just novelty. Shouldn't it show in other spaces, right? Um, so Smita Radhakrishnan, for example, has work on on uh, the IT sector, so does, um, so does Gauri Vijay Kumar. Like there were other people who were working around the same time on IT sectors in different cities and how labor was getting complicated in specific ways because of neoliberal logics. Um, and so if it was just a novelty argument, it should have happened in these other spaces. IT wasn't as interesting to me because it was a very diverse field. And I felt like something about lawyers was also just how much money they made, right? Like in comparison to what the middle class income was. And that changed quite significantly in terms of, and that was true for this entire elite law firm population. It wasn't as varied a field. So the one comparison that I thought was interesting was sort of international banks and consulting firms, right? So firms that were similar, that had a similar culture of recruiting from, you know, quote unquote top schools that were recruiting from um, urban, urban cities or, or, or people who had um, similar kinds of class and caste advantages. So it was a sort of homophilous sample in terms of what individuals would track into these two kinds of firms. And they often worked side by side in a lot of these transactions. So I thought it would be interesting to see how banks and consulting firms and, and sort of um, those that went through them, whether gender was playing out in a similar sort of way in these kinds of firms. So that's the sort of big comparison case. I think the traditional legal practice and the transactional law firm, that's what you'd expect. You'd expect an old sort of a linear litigation firm to have older scripts of gender performance and you'd expect and I and maybe perhaps you would expect that newer firms would have a larger a, a chance to renegotiate that opportunity but the interesting thing then was to add another sample where you know this modernity and meritocracy should have played out the same way but it sort of I argue did not in these other contexts and that helped me I think analytically clarify why the traditional um, I mean, sorry, why the new transactional law firm model, which is the main site of my analysis, um, was unique, even within a construct of what it meant to do modern or meritocratic work in this in this in this area. Um, I feel like I've, I've added the project enough, so I want to get to the main argument so we can have questions and comments. And the main sort of I'm, I'm going to spend maybe another five minutes in the main argument and maybe a few minutes on implications and then I'm really interested in what is in your questions. The, the sort of main argument is a four part argument, but I want to tease out just one mechanism that I think might actually tack on because with what I just said about Ridgeway's work and this idea of the ideal worker and explaining actually how the data variation happened, um, I've made the first of those cases. So the, the main argument is sort of like a co-mingling of four main things that I that I argue come together to make what becomes unintentional accidental um, parody, right? So is parody feminism is really literally the substance of my entire prologue. And so I'm not going to get into that debate here, but sort of, and, and, and I'm happy to send whoever would like to read it a draft of that version of it, because I think that's part of the theoretical um, weight of the argument. But for the purposes of thinking through just is this even, is this parity that's unintentional? Um, what does it rest on, right? And this is the main empirical contribution of the book. I, I argue that there are four things that happen, um, not just because I love alliteration, but also because I, this was sort of the main mechanism that was working. Uh, the first is this frames, right? There was something new about this professional identity corporate lawyers, there wasn't an image of what a good corporate lawyer was um, because 1991, which is when the, um, the markets opened in India and where liberalization brought new kinds of work, um, changed the kinds of work that was even available, right? So there was new kinds of project finance work, there was new kinds of banking, there was new capital markets work that just didn't exist in India before 1991. And so what the call was, for, was for a kind of professional identity or a professional worker that didn't exist before. And who got validized wasn't really validized on the basis of gender because it wasn't like a male corporate lawyer was doing that work before. It was just whoever can do this work best will do it. And that negotiation literally happened because it was a brand new frame of reference, nothing about corporate law in the way in the avatar that it ended up being in, in post 91 existed before 91, right? So I argue that actually this idea of the ideal worker shifted a little 
and that performed a version or that offered a capacity for a new kind of professional identity to perform itself. So that's the sort of frames argument. And as I just said, this Ridgeway's model of like, well, new places can give you new opportunity to rethink how hierarchy ought to work. That was the novelty argument. That's the first part of, you know, they got framed differently. Um, the, the sort of second substantive chapter extends that a little bit, right? In the way that I just said the data did, which is, yeah, that's true. The frames are different. They're similar. They allow you to have this expansive possibility. But there was something distinctly different about local firms, right? So 1991 markets open, but part of what happened was also India's law, legal profession did not allow for uh, foreign law firms to have Indian offices. So by regulatory necessity, right, like by regulation that had nothing to do with feminism, that had nothing to do with gender, what ended up happening was that foreign work still came to Indian lawyers within Indian law firms that were responding to a foreign market, right? And, and I want this distinction, I'm, I'm stressing on this distinction because I argue that that regulatory logic was, pre, was literally what predicated who would have the advantage because the contrast in the consulting firms was that they were Indian offices of foreign firms, right? So if a large consulting firm has a Bombay office, um, part of their, because consulting, again, consulting and banking did not have the same restrictions on professional practice in India that law, that law did. Um, the being a international firm in a low, being a local office of an international firm versus being a local office of a local firm doing international work, that distinction I argue was really crucial. Um, the sort of reason it was deeply crucial, and I'm going to go forward a little bit just to make that case, was because the Indian firms, the local firms that were elite law firms doing foreign work, didn't have any scripts for how this work had to be done, right? So there was all this new work, and someone had to do it. So, you know, one of these partners says, you know, we just adapted. Um, we had no one teaching us, we had to learn, but this was new, and we've managed, and we made this work. There's an innovation argument built into this for how they did this new work. But the sort of important reason this is slightly different from the other cases is because they had to differentiate themselves from the litigation firms that were very traditional because they were trying to make up like a meritocratic modern identity. But they also had to mimic, right? So I make this case that it was actually a two-part argument. They both had to differentiate themselves from other firms that were traditional to say, hey, we're not like them. But they also had to like, uh, you know, make aggrandize themselves in a way that suggested that they were global in ways that others weren't. Now, why is this we are global important? I mean, I, I make the case that it was a legitimacy logic that the, that, the, that the corporate law firm, I mean, the consulting firms that had Bombay offices did not need to do. I mean, if you, had, if you were a top consultancy firm that had an office in India, it's very easy for you to be able to say, excuse me, this is not about me because I happen to work really well in these other spaces. I am of course modern. The thing that is stripping my modernity and capacity for meritocracy is India, right? And this actually comes out in the data. So there are people in my sample from consulting firms who will make the case that we've been really good on gender in other places, but you know, India, right? Like wink, wink, like you understand this is really hard in India. That capacity to, to sort of um, shrug off a, a blatant, uh, non-meritocratic logic as just being something that's Indian was not something that because of a range of regulatory reasons, Indian law firms could do because they necessarily were responding to a foreign market while also having none of the legitimacy that foreign firms in India had just seamlessly, right? So they had to, they had to do what I call this differentiating and mimicking um, and together, I argue that it's it's a way of thinking about how they did speculative isomorphism. Um, they decided that they would they imagined and assumed that this is way good good meritocracy gets done, and they took these ideas and they made onto it a myth compliance. And again, this is a neo institutionalism argument that I don't want to get into the depth of the theories of, but I'm happy to argue for anyone that's also similarly dorking out about new institutionalism in the audience. Um, but part of this big argument, I think the, the sum total of this argument that I want to make clear is that they had a necessity to legitimate themselves and differentiate themselves from other firms that foreign firms in India just did not have. So to go back to that, you know, what was this a function of? 
there was a framing logic that, that new professionals had new identity, but also the firms themselves had an identity crisis. They had to prove that they were modern and they, had, they couldn't rely on you know, the cultural capital that you get by being an American firm or a, or a sort of global transnational firm that happens to have an Indian uh, office, right? So it wasn't like, you know, micro, I'm using Microsoft because they definitely were in my sample and they're not a consulting firm. But if you can imagine Microsoft in India can shrug itself and say, you know, we, we are a global firm and we have something in India. Although Microsoft is probably a terrible example. I'm not gonna go on that loop, but I'm making the case that firms had to have an identity that they performed. And that identity was so fragile because they were brand new and they had to keep it, uh, they had to keep it, they had to keep up that identity as a performance, both against the traditional firms that they were trying to distinguish themselves from, but also as, as global and as modern as, as the kinds of firms that were global that they were trying to mimic. Um, that's the sort of, sec that, like I said, I have these four mechanisms that I think overlay over each other. And I wanted to unpack that firm's mechanism because I think it sort of rests a way in which this was distinctly dissimilar to the other logics because the, the frames analysis was true in the consulting firms too, um, but the firms was very particular to the firms. The second thing that sort of extends from that is who their clients were. Local firms having global clients versus global firms having local clients were distinctly different, right? So if you were a local firm, as many of these elite law firms were, they did their legitimacy through client expectation, right? So if the, you know, so a lot of the times women were staffed on matters, not because they were trying to do gender differently, but literally because a client would say, I know she quote unquote gets the job done. And so I want her, I worked with her before I want her. Now this gets the job done is an essentialism argument that, you know, it doesn't serve women, right? It's the sort of essentialism that often works against women's interests. But in this particular case, it subverted the ways in which uh, legitimacy could get done and get valorized. And I argue that that sort of benevolent return to what is actually pretty sexist, right? Because women also had to perform a certain kind of femininity for that return to happen, um, was, was newly responded to, again, because it was brand new, again, because the regulatory ideals meant that these were foreign firms giving foreign work to local, to local firms. But it didn't exist in the, in the counter case, which is these consulting firms, because most of their clients were large Indian companies, right? And they were sort of, they were still uh, reproducing tropes of how gendered hierarchies ought to work in ways that didn't quite pass um, across these across these different logics. So that's the facings chapter. It also, it also makes a case for how socialization in schools changed the ways inter colleague interactions happened within these firms and how that also complicated how um, advantages persisted, right? So a lot of the, the firms here, one of the main accidents was that, well, accidents was that the uh, law schools that graduated the students that would then become lawyers in these elite firms were one of like five schools and now it's probably one of eight schools, but like it's a small sample of schools that were feeding in um, to these firms. And those schools were also socializing in specific kinds of cliques, the kinds of actors that would then get reproduced. And, and I think that's important in terms of how um, mechanisms get done because engineering schools, at least elite engineering schools were not similarly gendered, right? And so, or, and business schools were not similarly gendered. So the kinds of elite socializations that happened changed the kinds of facings that women had in these firms. Um, finally, I make a case for like, families, which is just that they also had the tremendous advantage of a previous generation of um, care that was just available to them. And I make a social movements argument that I'm happy to get back to in, in question Q&A if that's helpful. But it was the temporality of who did this work and how caste dependent the labor, the labor that they relied on was and how class dependent the capacity for them to rely on a previous generation of women to help do child rearing and, and family work was. And sort of it makes a case for how to think about um, what movement temporalities are, like when you borrow movements or when you borrow scripts from movements can actually tell you um, what kinds of advantages from those movements can extend to you, I think. Um, but, but yeah, the, the sort of crux of the book is that there was a central overlapping of these factors, none of which individually were meant to do gender differently. They were all, um, they were all sort of, 
they all had to happen, but they also had to come together at a certain point in time for a certain visibility of equity to happen. And even here, I don't, I make a very strong case that it wasn't active, um, it wasn't active lack of, it wasn't active um, uh, positivity, but rather just a lack of abject negativity, right? So there was just no discrimination. It wasn't like there were positive things put in place in these firms to make women do better. It was just an oasis of parity because everything else was bleak and they had this capacity within these right, if, if their circumstances were right, to feed into an organization or set of organizations where they're, um, they would not be deprived of their potential in the ways that might have happened to them if they'd gone elsewhere. So what do we do with this? I know I'm at like 28 minutes. So I, wanna, I wanna start wrapping this up. So what do we do with this? Where does it leave us? Where do we go from here? Is it just a case study? Can we learn more from it? Um, I, you know, when I, when, I was, when I would first talk about this book, I would always feel terrible that there isn't a way for this accident to just manifest itself. Of course, like not that I would feel terrible, but it would, it would trip me up to think about how this accident can manifest and what we even think about. Um, when it's just a case study, right? If you can't port the accident, what then is the book's con uh, contribution? And I think there's sort of like a, a, a I'm, I'm happy to think through, I really hope we think through this together and there are more extensions, but, but I wanna just say the first extension I think of is just how to think about novelty and timing, right? Like when things happen can matter and sort of newness can matter, but only specifically. But it can give us a way to think through what kinds of ideal worker constructs do we hold and how do we then queer them or subvert them or extend them or make those categories different with our with intention, right? That's the that's the main shift. It's yes, this started off as something that's a precarious mobility by accident, but how do we then convert that accident to real in, you know, a real um, intentional step forward? And and I think that that capacity that alchemizing of like taking one thing and making it the other is sort of where our task is at hand. The second extension, of course, is sort of what do we think of as the usefulness of intention? Uh, this is an image that sort of frames the book uh, for those of you that have read it. And it's my, it's a picture my three-year-old father took of my grandparents. So um, it's one of my favorite pictures of them. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny picture. But I like it because obviously he was trying to frame their faces and right like so there's there's a, it's a picture of like it's a bad picture. But I love it because it says so much about so much that if you knew my family and, 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 and versions of it that are ridiculous and beautiful alike, you would find in it. So I guess part of it is what do we do with something that looks good to you, even if it's constructed by accident and can you be optimistic about something that has a sort of path dependency like this? Is it even feminism? And I hope we get to that. Um, but sort of the overarching argument is this idea of like being more curious to things that don't have intention, right? Like how do we think of, of people who don't think like us, who don't have the same um, path as us to think about things a certain way and how do we actually think, um, think past that capacity for intention? The sort of third extension is the perils and power of optics, right? I just wanna, I wanna put this out there because the very year that India would go, you know, would, would make this case for how it was promoting partners. And these were not people in my sample. So this is not, I'm not outing any, anyone here. And was it, it was useful thinking about how the US then changed the kinds of, um, you know, how, how the US does diversity versus how this how optics can actually obscure underlying inequities, I think it's worth thinking about, right? Like you, on the one hand, you know, this resilience is likely to be short-lived, it's likely to be one generational, right? You're relying on um, mothers that might not pass on to the next generation, but also firms are profiting from being able to talk about it in specific ways. And how do we think about the capitalism involved in that? I think that's useful to think through. I just want to end with optimism because I might have, I don't know if I sounded as pessimistic as I feel, but I think it's worth ending with a little bit of optimism, which is just this idea that there is an optimism to path dependency. So even if it wasn't with intention, at this stage, these are large law firms that are um, structured to produce a specific cohort of women that just happen to be in senior positions now that are going to change the nature in which this can happen and maybe there is usefulness for long-term implications of inclusion and diversity within these firms if you think of it like that and so I want to end there 
um, for questions and comments. <laughs> but I also want to just remind Simra to put the, the code in the chat whenever it is it's possible. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and um, I'm glad you mentioned early on that you have your PhD from Stanford because I forgot to mention that. And you think I would have just <laughs> dropped that in. It was so um, long ago, I don't even think it counts. Well, I wasn't there then, so I guess that's in my in my defense. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to just push you on a couple of things, and then we have some great questions coming in as well through the Q&A. And Simrat's putting in the chat a link if you want to buy the book and also a discount code. Uh, so um, make sure you write that down. All right, Sweta, um, if there was one phrase that describes what I was feeling while I was reading your book was, Yes, but <laughs> that's just, I couldn't get away from this question that I know you get all the time is accidental feminism. Feminism. Um, My favorite and least favorite question. I know, and I'm sorry, but I do feel that I'm not speaking just for myself uh, asking this. But I also, because you've thought about it so much, I wonder if you are um, a closer, you, you talk about the usefulness of intention in extension number two, but are you yeah. closer to a... A, a, a firmer theorizing of intent, the mm -hmm. way that I read it um, very simply is that um, if the impact is negative, then the impact matters. So yeah. unintended racism is racism, regardless of what the intention may or may not have been. But it seems to be if the impact is positive, then um, intent becomes more salience and, and willfulness becomes an, an, an issue. So unintended feminism, is it feminism? So putting it in the binary of whether the impact is negative or positive kind of makes sense, but it doesn't feel good. I don't know, it feels too yeah. simplistic. So where are you with that? Where am I with that? I've grappled yes. with it and been so um, deeply um, I've, I've been, I've, I've really grappled with it. It's been 10 years in the making. I have thought and unthought and we thought it would not have been called accidental feminism 10 years ago or even two years ago. Actually, even while it was going to press, my editor's like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you ready? This is so great. This will be great. And I was like, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to lose all of my peeps who will think that I am making this case for like unintentional feminism as, you know, like somehow there's a valorization of it being good that that would be implicated in it. And I think it is a running thread. You're totally right. I've agonized about it, but it's also the question I get asked the most. And I think at the end of it, I think it was a very intentional choice. It wasn't by accident that I chose accident, right? Like, so for example, one of the reviewers, uh, one of one of the recent reviews of the book sort of, you know, said, this is great, this is great. It's really catchy, but isn't this just free market feminism? It's just like a reproduction of like a free market. Like why, you know, and you wouldn't want free market feminism to be called feminism. And notice I'm not calling it feminism. I'm, call, you know, just as how governance feminists are not calling governance feminism feminism. I'm offering it as a way of thinking about what's happening here as accidental, right? So I'm not still calling it, so it's still a term. I'd like for the theoretical valence of it to be together as it is. This is an accidental feminist outcome, right? Like how mm -hmm. we feel about it changes depending on what the site is. Mm -hmm. But just as how liberal feminists aren't, fem you know, like you could argue that liberal feminism or governance feminism or any other, you know, add the hashtag before is necessarily a clubbed theoretical concept because it's different from the base concept it's working from right so I think so that's the first thing I'll say about it but this idea of like is it this other thing I think it's worth remembering that it's not it the fact that it's not the fact that it was accidental was theoretical because it changes the ways in which we think about the direction in which a thing is falling. So I start my conclusion and I, I know we're running out of time and there are four questions and I wanna get five now that I wanna to get to. Um, but in my book, in, the conclusion starts with a sort of um, etymology discussion and like how I even came to the word and what it means. And I try to think through, well, I started with the Latin word for, you know, for how accident and incident are together and separate. And the root word that binds them cedar is to fall. Right. And the difference between accident and incident is that accident is to fall in the direction of, right? It's some, it's it's sort of to fall forward. It's it's the diff, the distinction in it is not so much that it's not a trip, right? It's not a word that actually kills a past misconception. It's actually something that falls in the direction of what you want to do. So and, and I think there's something mm -hmm. hopeful and positivist and sort of um 
despite my ambivalence of the term, something that's not accidental about that theorizing. Um, and also empirical work like this, so part of the, uh, the extension to your question, other than you were kind to not ask it, but I think the extension to that is, you know, how can you use something about corporate lawyers and make a case about feminism? Because even if it wasn't accidental, it's governance feminism and it's probably liberal feminism and it's not. And I think empirical work like this, and I think my first response is that I sort of couldn't have answered it with this book given the empirics of it, but also to be provocative, I don't know if that answering it is necessary because I think it has theoretical valence of thinking about other concepts and possible constructs. Um, if, it's not, if it's not a fulfilled response, it's because I can't imagine it to be. I imagine that I will grapple with it as a thing and not a thing, but that complication between categories is actually productive to me. And I hope it is to others. I'm invested in the process, not the outcome. So even if you disagree with it, if it allows you to think with and through, it's already done its work in, in my head. Thank you. I, I like the, uh, the the framing of accidental feminism as, as one concept so that you, you're not even making the case that it yeah. is. Uh, feminism. We have some great questions in the chat, some comments as well. Uh, but I want to uh, I want to ask you about one other thing, and then I'll put my reading glasses on and start uh, reading more in more detail what's there. Um, so the other thing I keep thinking about, partially because that's what I do, is the figure of the dancer. Um, and uh, forgive me, this may just be me. So if this is going nowhere, then that's uh, fine. Uh, uh, just bear with me while I while I tease this out. And I made some notes. Uh, so I feel that the, the hereditary female dancer, that the, the wife, the David Assey, um, is in some ways like the elite female mm. lawyer, um, in that she cannot exist in either the modern nation state or uh, or global capitalism yeah. as is. Um, and so there's a repackaging to for, for that um, for her to be acceptable in um, the, for modern bourgeois or global uh, in the elite lawyer case consumption. Yeah. Um, and so the dancer is a, a now a middle class girl from a good home uh, and the elite lawyer exists in an environment where gender does not matter but it does matter. Um, and you talk about Rashida in chapter four and she doesn't want to smoke because she doesn't, but she, feel that, that she feels that limits her access to this, this performance of modernity and this performance of global acceptance. But she also worries if she does smoke, then she might be judged for it because she's yeah. aware that women on the whole don't or are expected not to. So when women cannot be who they are in order for their histories to exist, then how is that even anywhere near feminist? So first Sorry. Of all, thank you for reading so closely that you remember Rashida from chapter four. I that, made a note. <laughs> no, but I appreciate that. Thanks for getting that far into the book. I really appreciate that. There's so much going on that I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, it's a wonderful book. Everybody read it. Oh my God. That's not, that, it wasn't a pitch for you to pimp out my book. I'm just really grateful, I really am. Um, so a couple of things. So if there's anything I'm actually really, that I grappled with even more than accidental feminism, it was that quote, gender does not matter. I was like, oh my God, I can't put this in this book because people are then gonna think I truly do believe gender doesn't matter, which is why there's 31,000 words of footnotes in the book that like literally unpack like every part of my caste positionality and class positionality and like all of the trans advantages that are you know intrinsic to reading in the way that I'm reading this. And I think the gender does not matter is of course couched in all of these other narratives. And I just noticed a question in the chat about like how much of this is like, how much of the privilege is accidental, right? And of course that's not accidental, that's deeply rooted and intimate and part of the production of how this even gets done. But I think the Rashida example is really interesting because one, Rashida is actually not a lawyer, she's a consultant, right? So she was in the, in the, in the, global, in the local office of a global firm. And so it was interesting because it was actually making my case that Rashida felt confined to do a version of global modernity and, and meritocracy and felt like she either had to club in in a specific way, but also not, despite having the same class and caste privileges, right? So if you remember the analytical variation I was trying to make, it's that, you know, they sort of had the same kinds of advantages, broadly speaking. They all went to like sort of English medium schools. They were mostly urban. They had family that lived close that could take care of their children and do the high class labor of taking care of their children while their maids did the lower class labor of like, you know, not the fun work that their mothers wanted to do. But it's worth 
thinking about how this distinction that you're drawing is actually about um, it is a, it is that class and caste matter and it's not fully feminism in that sense but that also that she was doing a particular kind of perform politic within that context right and Rashida I think is a great example because it goes back to the socialization argument of like law schools that were doing this where you know you smoked or not smoked your coolness was not predicated on it because there were, there were like 30 other scripts that you could figure out how to do coolness within and you'd have a click for it and it's a position of numbers which by the way is at the end the only reason I'm optimistic about any of this is because the numbers that are moving in allow women to not be just one kind of woman because it moves past the tokenism argument right like and, and that was the advantage your connection to the Devadasi idea like you you make my heart expand in a lot of ways but I think that comparison I have sat with it um in, in ways that I think really does something different for the model we're thinking about because I think you're right there there's something very specific about the parts of this that are accidental and the parts of it that are not so I'm starting to think of it as like a, a sub-accidental model of feminism right <laughs> like because there are parts of it that there is a so uh, Kalpana Kanabaran and I as you said have a book that's coming out with Zuban in a few weeks and we quote um, Sonal Makija's 2010 piece on um, bar dancers, right? And sort of how this colonial morality, right? Had a very specific vein of post-colonial yes. interests of what they thought of as local and global elites. And so the Devadasi woman becomes the you know prostitute adjacent woman. And then the Bharatanatyam dancer becomes the culturally appointed, even though they're both doing sort of culturally appointed logics, but it's still, how can you rescue certain parts of that cultural logic and how do you make the rest terrible? But part of saving certain parts of that logic is predicated on being violent to the parts you leave out. Like, right, it's a Weberian analysis of like, you have to be terrible to the parts you leave out to really hyper theorize the parts that you keep. And so I think this, this way is that, I think that distinction is really central, but I will say that other ways in which this class and caste play out is usually with good modernity. So Smitha's work on like, you know, how to think about respectable femininity, uh, Radhakrishnan's work on the IT sector, I think is a good parallel. And that's what I was starting with. I expected to find some version of that in the middle class mobility that was happening here. And so I do think it's slightly different. And I think it's an ec economy argument. It's because these people made more money in one generation than their parents did. And so the capacity to you know, moderate what that morality looked like and whether it was feminism at all was moderated with a economic exchange that was distinctly different and did not exist in other contexts. Thank you. Thank you for taking that on. That was that was me kind of spinning off. All right, let's see. I, I know that you love questions about uh, data. So let's start. Uh, let's start with that question from Arada Krishnan. Um, thank you for your brilliant work. Um, how would you differentiate trans local analysis from mere comparatism? I hope yeah. I say that right. What makes data pilot data? I love that. Uh, just a point of entry, any point of entry, exemplary or non exemplary. Exactly. Oh, Radha, you can't have this in the chat. And then you live three <laughs> houses from me. We should have like a long chat about this. This breaks my heart that I'm just responding to this. This is, oh, this is a question that could be a piece of like theoretical critique in and of itself. I'm so, so grateful. Um, okay, so just to sort of get to the, wait, hang on. I've moved it to the answer. So it's oh, live right. now. Like, so that's where you'll find it. it. But yeah. I'm going to answer it now. Um, what makes data pilot data? It's like, you know, it's, it's a very sociological term perhaps. And um, I'm both grateful for that training, but also feel very stifled by it. So I really urge, I don't know if there are any um, researchers or grad, grad students in the audience, but please read the research methods. It's sort of, I left my, I left my soul in the preface and the research methods of my book and for a very specific reason. And I think it unpacks just Pilot data was because I started as a grad student that actually was thinking of comparativism as the only way in which to do this. So I was thinking about the model, the inherent background framework of how I was even thinking of whether something was success or not was because it was coming from um, an, an American sociological concept of whether something would be seen as good outcomes or bad outcomes. And so the pilot data was really just to, it wasn't so much to test it, but it was to observe it from a lens that already had certain expectations of how it would play out. 
right? So how does the empirical align with the theoretical? It doesn't. Oftentimes, it's at absolute odds with the theoretical, right? And so I call it um, I call it agoraphobia in my research method section, and I have this entire unpacking of how it's you know design happens over time I can give you two slides of how the design happened but really the design happened because I was in constant conversation with people and I would try to think through which parts of what argument worked or didn't work and then I'd go and revisit the data and be like does that really work like is this what was happening did this did Rashida actually say no because of x rather than y right and so um the empirical sort of definitely is an extension. I don't know if it outsources theory, but I would argue that it's actually a recursive process where there isn't a direction. It's like a sort of eight model, right? I've started to think of this eight model loop of theory design and praxis. And no researcher is unbiased. No researcher comes in without priors. And I definitely had mine, but it went back and forth. But I appreciate that question so much. Thank you. So I think as we're heading towards uh, the top of the hour, I think I would like to take these two questions together because they're both really about privilege and elitism and how we define those. So um, the questions are, what role, if any, did pedigrees such as graduating from a high stage as law school, yeah. such as NLS, uh, play in shaping the new professional identity, Absolutely. frame and legitimacy. And then, um, so the audience can't see the question, so I just have oh. to read them out and then I'll make them live so they can see them. Uh, and then um, question about privilege, whether it can be accidental. Yeah, uh, thanks Radha, uh, thanks for being here. So, okay, so Arvind and Shambhavi, thank you so much for your questions. Um, so, I, I do want to say a couple of things. So the, the, the first is chapter two actually goes into depth, Arvind, on what it means to actually do um, elite law schools and sort of reproduce elite privilege across these different sites and what that meant for professional identity. And so, yeah, that was definitely part of the frames argument and also part of like what this legitimacy war, right? They could, they could afford to, they could afford to select and valorize on cultural capital, broadly speaking, right, rather than gender, because it was available in this concentrated form because of a range of, um, a range of regulatory um, uh, ways in which law schools started graduating lawyers that would become laborers within these law firms at the same time. The law schools were not set up to feed into these law firms. That was an accident too. They were set up to be social justice institutions. The law firms did not open because the law schools were starting, although you could imagine a version of that history where that happens. The law schools, the law firms were set up because the market opened. The law schools were set up independent of the market opening, right? But they both then started to feed into each other in ways that redid this professional identity and advantage. And chapter two, like, sort of talks a lot about how this was a function of these specific schools. Um, I think Shandami's question is sort of like, how does caste and family privilege transfer? It transfers over and over and over again. Chapter six, like, makes this big argument of both intergenerational intergenerational caste capital, like positive caste capital that allowed you to have a property or family nearby or like friends in the city that could come and you know, help take care of your child or, or do this, but also women who are not in the labor market because high caste did not, high caste privilege did not result in you um, being in the labor market because of the time that the, that the sort of movement for being at work came in in the Indian context. So I'm, I'm sort of doing this really quickly because it's one or two, but I will just say that the, the advantages of positive class capital, but also the disadvantages of, um, or also the advantages of like a caste dependent labor force that would help them, like absolutely was not accidentally applied across sites. But the difference was even with that being held constant in the sort of broadest sense for this analytical variation, lawyers and consultants had very different experiences. And I think that's the interesting part of why this was accidental feminism and not in that other site. With that, uh, I think I would like to invite everybody, um, wherever you are, please, in the traditional way, put your hands together. And <laughs> uh, thanks, Swetha Valikrishna, for joining us today. It's it was what it was just now that we've done with the whole formal presentation, we met originally over cheese curds, fried cheese curds yeah. in Madison, Wisconsin. Do you remember that? I, I still have the farmer's market tote bag we got that day. It's hard to imagine, perhaps, for people that have not been to Wisconsin, how good deep-fried cheese is, but it is. <laughs> it is it's the best. best. 
uh, and I love that it's come all the way uh, a full circle. We, yeah, we, we met again in California. Me. Thank you for being here and thank you to the audience. And yeah, uh, I'm going to share my screen with a slide with some upcoming events and you can find everything you want to know about the Center for South Asia at Stanford at southasia.stanford.edu. Thank you. Bye.